weeks ago I uh, uh, when we dealt with the foot washing time because uh, last week we had Brother Johnny Rollett in and we had a great time with him this week even spent time with him through the week uh, he's a, a real encourager too he just uh, uh, just he he's legit I'm gonna tell you that so even my pastor looked him up on YouTube and listened to him and said man that, that guy's won some awards and stuff and I said yeah he's a better singer than he is a preacher but either way <clears throat> No, I'm picking, and Johnny would know I'm picking, but he is, uh, I always say, some folk can sing, some folk can preach, very seldom can you get somebody to do both, and uh, he's one of those that can do both, hallelujah, uh, you got your scriptures open, so we're going to be in his, what I would call his hour, when Jesus came to earth, and I was with my friend Chuck and Becky Bergen yesterday, they happened to be in town, they're pastors over in Kerrville, and they work with motorcycle ministry, and, and I hadn't seen Chuck in a little while, and when he showed up, he looked like Jesus, and uh, his hair down to here, his beard, I mean, Chuck, I mean, this was a clean-cut, little Pentecostal-looking dude for a long time, and now he looks like a heathen, and, uh, and I like the heathen look a lot better than the clean-cut Pentecostal look, can I get an amen? Because now he's able to reach people, you know, and he he's has that uh, idea to, to reach out to bikers. And so I just love Chuck. But spending just a little bit of time with him yesterday he reminded me of what a great group of friends I, I have over the years and have connected with. And uh, so it's been wonderful. I want to talk to you this morning, though, about his hour as we move through this, this time period of the life of Christ. Jesus knew that there was a hour. He knew there was a cup. He even mentions the cup. We'll talk about that later on in a few weeks. Uh, he understood that this was the reason he came for. And even at that, he prayed not his will, but God's will be done. As we move through life, we don't have that. God hadn't showed me the ending yet. I don't know how this thing's supposed to end. So I'm just going to keep on preaching, keep on staying with it till it happens. But among the apostles, when you think about all the disciples who became apostles, the one absolute stunning success was Judas. Hmm. And the one thoroughly failure was Peter. Judas was a success in the ways that most impress us. He was successful both financially and politically. He cleverly arranged to control the money of the apostolic band. He skillfully manipulated the political forces of the day to accomplish his goal. It was Judas that had the ability to go in among the Pharisees to get them to uh, take out Jesus during the betrayal. It was Judas that decided 30 pieces of silver. It was Judas that he had such an ability to connive his way through life. And many times we look at people like that and we say, what a success. You know, look, they've built this great business or they got this great church or this, that, and the other. And then Peter, absolute failure in ways that we most dread. He was impotent in a crisis. He, he, he sank walking on the water. He was inept socially. He probably had some issues even talking with people, um, connecting with them. And at the arrest of Jesus, he absolutely collapsed. Amen. He, get, he Three times he said, I didn't know him. I didn't know him. I didn't know him. Everybody saw him wearing a cross around his neck. They knew. He knew him. That's a joke. Okay, the crosses didn't happen until later on. But he was, a, he was a coward. He gave in in the most critical situations of his life. The confession on the road to Caesarea Philippi, on the vision on the Mount Transfiguration, he said the most embarrassingly inappropriate things. Do you have friends like that? He's not the companion we'd want with us in a time of danger, and he was not the kind of person we would feel comfortable with at a social occasion. It would be Peter that didn't wash the feet of the disciples when they came in. It was probably his feet that stunk the worst. Dom, of course, has reversed our judgments on these two men. Judas is now a byword for betrayal. Uh, Peter is the one of the most honored names in the church and in the world. They have built great cathedrals. They named churches after Peter. Judas was a, vil a villain. Peter became a saint. Yet the world continues to chase after the successes of a Judas. They press into that. Financial wealth, political power, 
We have politicians that tell us, you vote us in, we'll do this, that, and the other, only to find out when they get in, greed takes over their life. And when greed takes over your life, you're in trouble. I was telling my pastor this morning, the greatest thing about Christ in my life is helping keeping me balanced. Because balance is so important. I want to talk to you about what I'd call a seed called greed this morning. That there's simply a seed that will go into your life that can cause, and everybody here fights greed. Some of you are greedy about revenge. You want to take revenge. You're upset with people. You're mad. You know, things didn't work out the way you wanted it to. And because of that, you go after it. You're greedy for that. Some are greedy after finances. They want more. The more you get, the more you want. The more you want, the less you enjoy what you already have. And we get greedy after it. And as a pastor, I know pastors that are greedy. They will take most of the finances of a church. They'll pay their staff a little bit. They'll take care of the electric. And then they keep the rest for themselves. Never been that way. Never want to be that way because I know what... Uh, uh, too much money can do to people, amen, and how it affects them. Some of you want to win the lottery. You're greedy for the lottery. You put more money in the lottery than you've ever put into your church. And you keep believing that it's going to hit, it's going to hit, it's going to hit. It's never hit, but when it does, you tell God, if it hits, first ones I'm going to do is bless the house. But you can't give a dime on a dollar. So you're greedy. If you hit the lottery, the worst thing that happened in your life would destroy you. Amen. Too much to get you. So there is, and then... This man's life, Judas, greed began to overcome him. And we find not only the 30 pieces of silver, but political power, the president. I'm somebody, you ever, you, this thing about um, knowing celebrities. Boy, aren't we big on this? Man, we'll, we'll drop names and we know a certain celebrity or this, that, and the other. It was, it was uh, Judas who said, yeah, I know the wave walker. Yeah, I know the one that can take out, uh, make eyes see again and ears pop open. The, the, the lame will walk again. I know him. Yeah, that's Jesus, man. I hang out with him, ate with him last night. And because of that connection that he had, he was able to use it to further his greed. John 12, 23, Jesus said to them, and he said, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And when you hear the word glorified, you think, well, what's that got to do with it? Remember, in our lives, we're justified just as if we never sinned. Sanctified, that's, that's uh, going to take a long time for HD. Amen. That's the cleaning up. That's the washing of the word. That's every time you're here, you get, your mind's getting washed a little bit better. You're getting closer to God. You get a little more convicted. That's your sanctification. But glorification, you cannot get glorified till this, until you die. So somebody said, I, I want to be glorified. Not yet, you don't. Amen. That glorification takes place after our death, and the death to this earth suit. Amen. So Jesus talked about glorified. Amen. In other words, he said, I'm going to have to die in order to be glorified. It's coming soon. So he knew it. He discerned it. Amen. He understood the hour. He understood that season, and the hour represented the crucible of his life. He knew it would eventually arrive, and now it's here. He faced an event that would divide time, go down in history as something every soul would have to acknowledge. This was the apex of his death. Destiny. I've often said of his hour, the, all of our lives hinged on what would take place over the next few hours in his life. Amen. And he set that thing forth. In John 13, 10, Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. We're going back to where we were a couple of weeks ago. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one of you is clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, for that I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. How many remember and understand this does not mean you literally washing somebody's feet. Right? This means doing something, serving somebody, doing something for them outside, humbling yourself. Amen. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is the, a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So look what he did. First he stood. Everybody say stand. He stood. He rose up. Then he stooped. He rose, he stooped, he humbled himself, amen, then he stripped, he uncovered himself at that moment. Listen to me, you can only uncover yourself around people you love or love you. You can only reveal yourself to them. Now, I don't mean literally removing your clothing. I mean, I mean telling them perhaps a secret or something about yourself. Only those who love you and you love should you do that for. 
So Jesus rose among the 12. He did that. He stripped. He served. Your ability to create unity is directly related to your ability to be a servant. If you want unity in a house, if you want unity in a business, if you want unity in a church, you got to start serving. And all of a sudden, I'm telling you, it will change the atmosphere. Nothing changes the atmosphere like serving. Let me tell you something else. Nothing changes the atmosphere like getting the wrong people out of your life. Boy, if you can get the wrong folk out of your life, atmosphere changes. So at this moment, you got 12 there. He gets Judas out of the way for a reason because I cannot talk to you if he's in the room. I can't tell you what I'm fixing to tell you if he's here. So Judas got to go. So now we read in verse 18, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified. You ever been troubled in your spirit? Now, this ain't some supernatural thing. This just means it ain't, it ain't digestion, uh, indigestion either. Trouble in your spirit means you felt something. You knew something was wrong in this situation. I've often used green light, yellow light, red light. Oftentimes when I get around certain folk, I get a green light. Man, it's like, go for it. That's going to be your friend for life. That you're going to connect with them. And then I get around certain folk, and I get a yellow light. When I get a yellow light, it just means caution. Pay attention. Until they've earned your um, relationship, respect, connection, just be careful with them. But every now and then, I get a flat red light. And when I get that red light, you ain't going no further in my life. You follow me? So at this moment, Jesus is troubled in his spirit. The, the yellow's going off in him. He said, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another. And when I read it, I just blew my mind. They stared at one another. They're looking at each other at a loss to know which one that he meant. One of them the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was that? John, of course it was John. Who's wrote, what, what book we in? John, of course, okay. I love, I just love John. He cracks me up. He reminds me of some of you. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now remember, John wrote 60 years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You got to keep that in mind. So he's looking back on all these things that took place. He's, he's remembering some stuff here. He was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to his disciple and said, uh, to the disciple John, said, ask him, ask him if it's me. <laughs> Listen, if you got to ask if it's you, it's not you. Amen? If you got to ask if it's you, you already know it's not you. That means you're sensitive enough. Amen. To discern the situation. Ask him. Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is one to whom I give this piece of bread. When I have dipped it in the dish, then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, Jesus said, do quickly, he told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Have you ever thought to yourself that the disciples were not the smartest or the sharpest crayon in the box? Seriously. He said the one I give the bread to is the one that did it. He gives the bread to Judas, and they said, well, I wonder why he did that. <laughs> he just told you why he did that. Judas goes out, and it's night. This would be the longest night of history. This is the night where so many things are going to be recorded. But what happened when Satan entered him is what we have to fight. This seed that goes into you that tells you you deserve more, you should have more. There should be more opportunities for you. Why am I running with this group? This is Judas talking, thinking to himself, and things aren't happening for me as fast as they should. I, I've got, I'm going to make some money off this guy. I know what I can do. <sighs> Something happened to him. Now, there's so many theological issues going on here. First off, was Judas born to go to hell? Was Judas born? Did God put Judas in the earth just so that he could use him as a pawn to go to hell? I don't think so. 
Did Judas have a free will? I think so. Did God already know what Judas was going to do? Absolutely. Just like us. So as we walk through this, you've got you to change some of the ways you think or maybe the way you were brought up as we talk about it. But listen to me. Peter tells us, chapter 4, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So if you're going through some trouble, don't let that shake you. And here we find this moment in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Uh, Paul speaking here, I believe, says, See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The issue with bitterness and we are all susceptible to this. You think you can run along and things are good and, and you, you're way up here spiritually high. Well, something can happen in your life and the next thing you know, that seed, a seed is so small. And it can enter through the crevice of a place called depression in your life and the next thing, discouragement in your life. The next thing you know, now you are bitter. And you start, and it starts coming in. I, there's nothing like the taste of bitter. You, woe unto those who love the taste of bitter. Some of you just like, you like, you like, you like, you like, you like. Some of you will give your baby a lemon slice just to video uh, their impression in that moment. I've watched you. You're cruel people. <laughs> but when you get something bitter, you know it's bitter. I mean, it, it just it, it causes your teeth to, to crush to the side. And it says here, beware, let a root of bitter. Bitterness means causing painful emotions felt or experienced in a strong and unpleasant way. Angry and unhappy because of unfair treatment. What you think is unfair. Philippians 2.12, therefore, my dear brothers, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. Everybody say, work it out. See, I can't take bitterness out of you. But I can tell you what bitterness is. I can show you the symptoms of it. The bottom line is, is all of us have to work out our salvation. Because if I get bitter, I'm going to cause you to be bitter. Bitterness does not just hang out by itself. It always, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I uh, it vomits on other people. That's not the word I was looking for, but it'll work. Amen. It throws up on others. It affects others. It, it, you, if you're bitter in the house, it won't be long till somebody else gets bitter because of you. It's transferable. It moves along. It's just something about it. Be careful with it. And how do, you, how do I work it out? I got to be careful because if you become self-absorbed, that's a part of recognizing bitterness. It's all about you. You show a lack of concern for others. You don't care what's going on around the world. That's why I always mention what's happening around the world. Amen. I want you to be recognizing it ain't all about you and living in Crosby, Texas. Amen. You get touchy. You're very sensitive. You think because the football team huddled, they're talking about you. It's, it's not that way. You get, I, you know, I have met people that are so sensitive. It, it, just one little squirt. What, it, it, listen, listen. If you're going to run with me and mine, you're going to have to learn how to take a joke. You're going to have to learn how to be punched just a little bit, poked just a little bit, pressed on just a little bit. We, we're not going to let you just run through life nice and easy. Hey, ain't nobody going to pamper and coddle you. We're going to tell you, look, for, as far as I'm concerned, I had a guy tell me this week, Pastor, you're going straight to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I agreed with him. <laughs> and, and that was a joke between both of us. But I'd made a statement and, and, and probably shouldn't have, but it was funny at the time. <laughs> and it's okay. It wasn't about none of y'all. Somebody at the other campus. But Kenny, if you're gonna if you're gonna hang with us, you gotta handle it. And so when people get upset, they're too sensitive, sensitive. They're too sensitive, and because of that, they get mad and leave the church. And they'll blame somebody. They'll throw blame at some. Somebody hurt my feelings. Somebody said this. Somebody did that. But eventually, it always comes back on me. Always does. I walked into a hospital this week. Sat down by, beside a guy. I didn't know for sure if he was somebody I knew, but he looked like it. Joseph said he was. He said, you know him. I said, I don't know. He's got a beard and he's skinny now. I sat down by him. I grabbed my phone. I called him on the phone. He answers the phone, looks over at me. Then they called his name in there, but there was no response. 
because he'd got bitter years ago about somebody else in the church. And that somebody else has already moved off. But they're not coming back because pride is an awful thing. But I didn't care. I wanted to call him on the phone, make him look at me. And then I text him and let him know I was pulling for him. Because if you're in the hospital, that means you're dealing with something. I don't care if you go to another church. I loved you a long time ago. I still love you. I mean, you can't make me hate you. Well. <laughs> How do you recognize hurt, Pastor? You become possessive of just a few friends. You have an unusual fear of losing them. Amen. You try to control them. You tend to avoid meeting new people. You show little or no gratitude. There's no yes, sir, and no, sir. Amen. You think you, you expect it. Extremes. You speak words of empty flattery or horse criticism. You hold grudges against people. Amen. You have a stubborn, sulky attitude. You know what sulky attitude looks like? It's when, it, when it's turned down, you look like that, 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 uh, no, no, Joe Biden, it's not Walter. Uh, you're usually unwilling to share, please forgive me, Democrats, amen. Usually unwilling to share, mood extremes, amen. But when you look at Jesus, totally different, amen. He was willing to wash servants' feet, would wash their feet. He designated the, the traitor, amen. He talked about, uh, to the disciples, and listen about Judas. He had a clean foot but a bitter heart. There's something about that. Humility, humility says this, I was wrong. Thanks for showing me my weakness. That's humility. Self-love is counterfeit. It leads to more discouragement and cover-up. Amen. Just all about you. The heart of Jesus, Jesus said, look, I'm not referring to all of you. I love you guys. I'm not referring to all of you, but I know who I've chosen. And it's to fulfill Scripture, Psalm 41, 9. Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. He tripped me up. Amen. Verse 27 says, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said, what you're about to do, do quickly. Judas, 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 Judas. Free will. Treasurer. Cast out devils. Part of Luke chapter 10, verse 20, when all the disciples came back and said, hey, we cast out devils. Jesus said, don't be uh, blown away that you cast out devils. Be, be blessed that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Said that to all 12. Now we're getting into some theology. People ask me, they say, what's up, Pastor? I say, heaven. And we're all going. And, and, and we're going. Uh, and I hope to go. Unless you're Baptist, you have to go anyway. It's funny how our theologies work. But now you throw Judas in the mix, it jacks with our theology. So here we find, and, and I'm not going to put Judas in hell. I'm just telling you. Acts 125 says, by transgressions, Judas fell. He trespassed. He, he messed up. His, his ability was his downfall. He was hurt. When did he get hurt? When did Judas, when was the, the seed put in that caused this moment in John 13? Well, in John chapter 12, there was an anointing that took place in a place called Bethany. There was Mary and Martha and Lazarus, the disciples in the room, they gathered around. And there in that room, Mary comes out, lets down her hair, and begins to anoint the feet of Jesus. She put the alabaster over him, which was meant for burial. It's to keep the body from stinking during the time in the tomb. And she began to put it over a live body. Ooh, I passed a young man this morning in the hall, and I said, boy, you smell good. Isn't fragrance a wonderful thing? Amen, to pick up on. So she began to pour that over the body of Christ, and here was Judas. Now, this ain't on the overhead, Sister Kim. It's just something that I just want to talk about real quick. But Judas had become toxic. When I say toxic, extremely harsh, malicious, harmful, and infectious, often caused from bitterness. Toxic. Bitterness, again, causing painful emotion. Jesus didn't view his mission as stopping toxic people from sinning. Jesus didn't, didn't go around and say, look, you're toxic. You need to quit sinning. You need to quit doing this. You quit now harming and being so mean toward him and bitter and cursing people out. He didn't do that. Maybe it seems more obvious to you, but it was startling to me when I realized Jesus knew Judas was a thief, and he never chose to stop him. He didn't stay. He knew he was a thief. 
And he didn't stop him. John 14, 4 says, one of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Who's writing this? John. John said, I've known now, 60 years later, Judas was a thief. Judas kept the money. Judas was after the money. A year's wages. He was upset about it. If John knew Judas was a thief, Jesus knew Judas was a thief. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 6, you back up six whole chapters, you read in John 6 verse 70, Jesus said, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He already told them that. Six chapters, but one of y'all is a devil. Can you imagine James looking over at John and said, He's talking about you. And James and John looking at Peter and said, we know he's talking about you. And they look over at Matthew. They're trying to figure out who is it. Wonder who, the, wonder who the devil is here. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who thought, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Jesus knew Judas was toxic. He could have stopped Judas from stealing and his future betrayal by kicking him out of the group at any time. He, instead, he washed his feet. He washed his feet. Verse 4 says, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, why hasn't this perfume sold? Why didn't, why didn't you sell it? You ever had somebody look at you and say, why don't you give that to the church? Why are you giving to the church? Why do you give your time, your treasure, your tithe, your talent to the church? Why do you do that? You could have gave that to the poor. You could have done that for somebody else. There are times in life, let me tell you, that something extravagant needs to happen. A vase has to be broken. I have said this so many times, give me my flowers now. Don't wait till I'm dead to line this place up with flowers and say, this is how we, no, 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 no. Give me my flowers now. I'm going to give her her flowers before I go. Johnny, you're wearing one of my shirts, so you are already got some of my flowers. <laughs> Joseph, you're wearing one of my shirts, so you already got one of my flowers. You're wearing one of my shirts. Hey, man, my God, my flowers are everywhere. Lose some weight, Jerome. You'll be wearing one of my shirts. <laughs> stay with me. Stay with me. Listen, so many times we want to honor people after they're gone. But Jesus looked at this woman, Mary, who wanted to honor him now. Amen. Do something for him now. And she poured the perfume over his body, and he rebuked Judas for this. Amen. Because Judas said well, it, it, it could have been used for the poor. He did not say this because he was, you know, because he cared for the poor. Verse 7, John 12 says, leave her alone. Jesus replied, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. But you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. If you take any notes from me, hear this. A, 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 A. Anger always assassinates authority. Anger always assassinates authority. Listen, hurt that's not dealt with brings a seed of bitterness into your life. Bitterness will cause you to start hating. Jesus said, you know, Jesus said if you looked on a woman to lust, you've already committed adultery. If you look on a brother to want to hurt him, you've, uh, to take him out, you've already murdered him. He brought it down to another degree. I mean, as, it, let me just say it like this. He put it in such a way that none of us can get away with saying we don't sin. Huh? Some folks say, well, I never committed adultery. I never fornicated. I've never stolen anything. I, I've, I've never uh, uh, murdered anyone. Jesus said, if you thought any of these in your mind, you've already done it. I guess I'm a sinner then. Can I get an amen? I guess I need Jesus. Come on. Amen. The sin showed me I need him. So it's very important to understand it. And hatred that's not dealt with brings to murder. Why, why, did, uh, why did Cain kill Abel, that whole list? Why was Esau after Isaac, that whole list? Anger always assassinates authority. Amen. When you get mad at your authority, whether it be a parent, whether it be an employer, whether it be a pastor, whether it be anyone else that's over you, uh, I don't care if, it's an off if an officer comes up to me, pulls me over, I'm using the word sir. Because oh, I promise you, if I wasn't speeding when he pulled me over, I was before he saw me. <laughs> and I have found that kindness is the way to deal with it. Can I get an amen? 
Don't be a smart aleck. Cop pulled me over when I was younger, said, you know why I pulled you over? And I said, because I let you. <laughs> Judas, 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 Judas was unknown by his friends. Judas was unfaithful to his Lord. And Judas was unmourned in his death. You can run in the house of God, you can be near Jesus, you can hang out, you can get your feet washed, amen, you, you can be, have a, 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 a position in the house and still fall. But one scripture that hits me all the time, and I believe it, uh, and I don't know where it's at in my head, I know it's New Testament, but the thing that I understood is I can stand and I can fall. We all can. The issue is just keep standing. Amen. Don't live in fear. Keep standing. I, I go to bed at night. I'm not concerned. I don't, I don't pray every night. Lord Jesus, please forgive me. I, I know that I, I walk under the blood of Jesus, just like you. You've got to believe that he washes away your sins. But if you've known you've committed a sin, tell him. Get forgiveness for that. Can I get an amen? amen. Let me start closing. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Peter said, during this time, Peter stood up in the company. There were about 120 of them in the room at the time. This is the, the gathering of the 120, amen, before, during the day of uh, Pentecost. And he said, friends, long ago the Holy Spirit spoke through David regarding Judas, who became the guide to those who arrested Jesus. That scripture had to be fulfilled and now has been. Now listen, how many went on the day of Pentecost? Y'all remember? Uh, there was like 300-something people that went up in the room. Renee, you remember? I'm trying to think that. You were there, okay. Uh, then you should know. <laughs> there, was, there was a truckload of people, 400, 300, I forget. But after X amount of days, there's only 120 left up in the, in the place of Pentecost here, okay? Now, as I'm thinking to myself, they had to ask the question. Peter, you ran with Jesus, you hung out with Jesus. What happened to Judas? Wouldn't you ask? I would have to ask. What happened to Judas? How did all that go down? Tell us a little bit about it. So at this moment, Peter begins to share with him. And he said, friends, long ago the Holy Spirit spoke through David. That's King David way back in the Old Testament regarding Judas. Are you kidding me? No. Who became the guide to those who arrested Jesus? That scripture had to be fulfilled and now has been. Judas was one of us and had his assigned place in this ministry. He was in this ministry. Amen. He was in forge. He was in swap. He was, in, he was in the ministries. Amen. He, he, he worked with us. As you know, he took the evil bribe money and bought a small farm. There he came to a bad end, re rupturing his belly and spilling his guts. Now, if you know the story, when he was hung, they left him hanging until his entrails burst. Everybody in Jerusalem knows this by now. They call the place Murder Meadow. It's exactly what we find written in the Psalms. Let his farm become haunted so no one can ever live there. And also that was written later. Let somebody else take his place. Two, two, two warnings. Two warnings. The journey into greed gains momentum. When you get greedy, when you want more than what God wants to bless you with, when you get envious and you want to take somebody else's place, it gains momentum. And as it does, it's hard to stop. Second, it's sad to be associated with Jesus and yet refuse him and be lost. I've often said of America, we are without excuse. We've got more gospel in this nation. We've got prophets prophesying. We got preachers preaching. We got evangelists reaching. We've got street preachers. We got it on YouTube. We got it on social media. This gospel is saturated around the United States, and yet there are people associated with it here in the gospel. They'll tell you, yeah, I, I knew Jesus. I was raised up in church. I, I went to Sunday school. When I did, I did Ralph Warner's funeral, Patsy, this week. His sister and uh, daughter-in-law stood up and said, Ralph was 46 years old. This was 25 years ago in my former church. He was 46 years old. She said, I want you, my father-in-law, to come to church and hear this cowboy preacher. And he said, hell will freeze over first. 
and he came anyway. And for 25 years, I've been his pastor. This is the greatest reward I've ever had is to see people that never knew Christ or maybe once loved him young it got involved in this church and stayed all the way up to the time I could do their memorial and I don't consider that cruel at all they're glorified new body new life I was with a man Joseph and Joshua with me with a man that had his second leg removed I'm, I'm telling you blew me away I'm in the hospital with him, and he looks at me, and his name's Michael. He's 67 years old. He's in the hospital, and he's got one leg's gone. I didn't even know that. He would come in, walk, coming in on his prosthetic. He, he loved church. Loved church. I mean, oh, God, I wish more people could love church like Michael. He said, Pastor, I, was, I wasn't brought up in it. He said, uh, my family knew a little bit about, he used the word religion. He said they were religious. But when I got involved in the little country church, I found my family. And when I found my family, everything changed. And he got excited. And, he, and, and now his other leg's gone. He's a skinny little dude. And he's got the other leg gone. And he was there. And this one blew me away. While, while I'm sitting, standing there talking to him, his, his leg's under the sheet. And I realized all I can see, nothing below his knees. And he points over at his prosthetic. But he said, I'm going to get me another one. And it won't be long. I'll be back with you. And he flew both, both legs up in the air. It scared me. <laughs> huh? Is that the truth? I thought he was coming up out of the bed. <laughs> but to have that attitude. And I said to him, Michael, when you get to heaven, you're going to get your legs back. You're going to get your heart back. There's so many things God's going to return to you. He loves you like that. I want to tell you, I do not believe that Judas was born to go to hell. I don't even know if Judas is in hell. It's not my place. I'm going to leave that up to God. But I will tell you this. When Jesus was arrested, Judas took those 30 pieces of silver and he threw them back into the temple. He recognized his wrong. Remorse fell all over him. Sometimes when it happens, it's just it's overwhelming. And then the skip in the record took place in his mind. I told this to some people today. They said, Pastor, what do you think about suicide? I, yeah. It's too final. It's too final. It's heartbreaking. We've all dealt with people. I've had relatives that have taken their lives. You've had relatives. You know of it. But it's almost a skip in a record. The old house I lived in had a record player. And if you ran through the house, it would jump the needle. And sometimes it'd scratch. And man, when, it, when it's your only Leonard Skinner album. And then, and then when it skips there, it'll go... It hang up. It just hangs up right at that moment. And I see people's minds get right there. And it hangs up. Your mind just hangs up right there. It doesn't see a future. It just hangs up. And what it takes is a nickel on the needle. And then another nickel. And then another nickel. According to how deep the groove is. And he's a nickel. And he's a nickel. And she's a nickel. And sometimes we got to gather with people that are struggling and be that nickel to help it skip past the spot it's stuck in so it moves to the future. Can I get an amen? Everybody follow where I'm going here? And that's what I've shared when I've seen it in people's lives. And I'll promise you, there was a time in my life that I needed nickels to come along and say, Pastor, don't do what you're thinking about doing right now because you've got a future. Boy, I feel Jesus. Judas was so remorseful, and what he had done was so wrong that there were no nickels to help him get through this time, and he hung himself. Hmm. 
that end of that scripture, Kenny says, when Jesus told him, go do what you're going to do. And then those last few words says, and it was night. There are some people that enter darkness that never come out of it. They enter into a dark place. Oh, to be the nickel. To help somebody move into their future. Heads bowed, eye closed. God, you led me into a direction I had no idea I was going. I want to be more like the young the man I saw in the hospital who looked like it's the end, and yet his attitude was so full of life. And yet many times we find ourselves like a Judas, so full of remorse over our sins, the hurt we've caused others, the seed of bitterness that entered our lives, greed that tried to take over. Lord, we're your people, and we, we need your help this morning. always since the answer is repent just to repent God forgive us for being too full of ourselves forgive us for being selfish forgive us for wanting to end a life that has a future forgive us for not being the nickels on the needle to help someone else out God help us we need you this morning. As your head's bowed, if you've been away from Jesus, would you just put your hand up? You know you've been away from him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you pray with me? Jesus, give me another chance. Forgive me. Wash me with your blood. Let your word come alive. I'm not going to stay this way. I'm going to do some things, make some changes for the better. It starts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Cheryl, be the nickel on the needle. That's a new one. How many ever did that? How many ever had a record player and you had to put coins on the needle to keep it moving? Mm-hmm. Some of y'all so old, you had 45s. <laughs> yeah. We got saints in here and all they had was reel to reel. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. If our servant leaders would come up, I got to go.